Hi, this is Eric Schlein, and you are listening to the Intelligent Investing Podcast, where I discuss value investing, rational analysis, and break down the processes, principles, and mental models of business owners and managers. Uh, today, we have back on Rafael Resendez, who um, we've had on the show uh, once before, and we were going to be talking about um, GameStop and Tesla, and actually doing a real-time uh, investment analysis on the show. But before we get into that, um, I just do want to talk about a recent book um, that I just finished uh, about a month ago or so. It was uh, Value Investing Second Edition uh, by Bruce Greenwald. And uh, there's a link to it on the show notes if you want to get the book. Um, but what I really like about it is it kind of speaks to what we did with Raphael in the last episode where it, you know, the book goes into some of the more modern frameworks of looking at uh, businesses and more modern kinds of businesses and um, say companies with economic moats and how to value that growth, how to have a more modern way of looking at value investing. So there's a, there's a few new chapters added to the book. thought it was really brilliantly done. Um, so if you're interested in value investing, but looking at more uh, modern day businesses, I uh, highly recommend the book by uh, uh, Bruce Greenwald. Um, and anyway, we have Raphael on. So Raphael, uh, welcome back to the show. Great to be back, Eric. How have you been? I've been pretty good. So I'm excited to do this today. There's a lot of people that want to hear uh, that are that are eager for this episode. So you know, Tesla's been in the news a lot. GameStop obviously has been in the news, obviously, uh, yeah, like every day. Um, so you know, the stock's gone from you know to 400 and then to to 60 and then and all over the place. Uh, and Tesla's obviously gone gone all over the place as well. So. Today, we're going to actually do a real time, you know, this has not been pre-planned. I have no idea what we're going to come up with here, but a real time, you know, intrinsic value analysis of both of these businesses. So, Raphael, um, you want to share your screen and, and, and take it away here? Sure. Let's do it. All right. Let, let's do it. Usually, I'm drinking tequila on the show, but today I'm drinking tea. Yep. I'm glad you got your, as long as you have your seatbelt fastened, because it's going to be a fun show. All right. All right, let's let's take a look at this. So let's let's start with a couple of basic principles and some sure. ground rules to think about value and, and intrinsic value. Okay. So we're going to work with a tool uh, we developed at Applied Finance back in the '90s, and we continued updating it. But the process we're going to go through is something called value expectations, which we unveiled back in 1998, and it's been the same process ever since because these are basically pretty timeless concepts of cash flows, risk, competition, and, uh, and growth to understand what the worth of a company is. And as we touched on last time, we have a concept that we created called an economic margin. And essentially what that does is it takes a look at all the cash a company generates relative to the cost of its investment base, how much it's invested and what the, cost, the opportunity cost of that investment is, and subtracts the two and divides by that investment base. And we're looking at Apple right now. And this is the economic margin chart for Apple. And you can see why Apple's been such an extraordinary investment story. Back in the early 2000s, Apple could move the capital. And I think if you, if you were to tell somebody Apple was a below average firm, they'd think you're nuts. But it's, it's very clear back in the 2000s, Apple was not earning its cost of capital. Right. Restructured the business, came out with iPods. All of a sudden, it went on a rocket ship of a journey, peaking with earning rates of return of 30% above its cost of capital, basically in 2012. And since then, it's basically been generating spreads of about 14% above its cost of capital. So we generate this chart for every company around the world, updated every week. Okay. Now, the other chart that goes in tandem with this that we're going to use and take a look at is something that we call an intrinsic value chart. And essentially what the intrinsic value chart allows us to do is trace out the valuation we've performed on the company through time. So I'm going to show you that for Apple quickly. Yeah, no, please. And then from that, we'll go into GameStop and take a look at that and what we've thought about it and then put you on the scene and, uh, get some of your expectations in real time and we'll, we'll calibrate them and see what, what it is that we're paying for at today's price. So the blue bars here indicate Apple's actual market price. The little 
slash at the edge represents its closing price. And then the solid gray line represents our real intrinsic value estimate for Apple at that point in time. We've been doing this since 1995. We've generated over 20 million estimates of intrinsic value since then. On any company we pull up, we'll see this chart and we'll get an idea of how well behaved the company's valuation is. So okay. with that in mind, uh, I'm going to pull up GameStop. Well, hold on, before you do that, so it says right sure, now intrinsic sure. value 7960. So price the target negative Intrinsic 40. value, uh, and, the, and the target is 145, correct. Now, we actually own Apple, and if you wanted, we could pull up. We could oh, so percent of target, from percent, a, negative, so negative 40%. You're not saying that you think the intrinsic value is negative, is 40% less? You think it's 40% more? It's 40% less on a, on a default basis. Okay. If we were actually going and value it, I could pull up our analyst model on Apple and kind of walk you through why there are a number of assumptions just taking the data as is is tricky for Apple. Namely, they have so much cash on the balance sheet. It's mm -hmm. really hard to project a default pro forma right. for Apple without stripping that cash out from an operations perspective. If we if we went through those machinations, kind of the the analyst or the corrected target price would be somewhere around 160 for the stock. But Got let's start it. with okay. game. Let's just sure. pop into sure. game. Let's do it. Let's do it. Game provides an interesting story because up until about <laughs> 2019, up until about 2019, this was a very well-behaved stock from an intrinsic value perspective. You can see it was more or less trading right around where its intrinsic value was from 2002 to 2008. Mm -hmm. From 2008 forward, intrinsic value was a little higher, but it basically caught up. And then all of a sudden, starting in 2019, something pretty dramatic happened. And let's take a look at the economic profitability of the stock to gain some insights into what's going on there. So we're going to pull up a chart that we yeah. call a wealth creation. And, and, and just so, and, and when you say something dramatic, you know, not everyone's going to be able to see the visual. A lot of people are just going to be listening to this on their podcast player. So just want to be mindful of that. Sure. Sure. And, and this chart will highlight what's happening. So basically up until about 2017, Game was a very steady economic performer. It was earning rates of return about 5% above its cost of capital. You can see that kind of here consistently generating. And when he says here, we're talking about the, the early, the early 2000s up to yeah. uh, 2016. From, from 2000 up until about 16. Yeah, absolutely. Then in 16, it dropped from a 5% spread above its cost of capital to two and a half. And in 18, it was at basically zero. In 19, it dropped to negative 5% below its cost of capital. So that's kind of the background from an economic profitability perspective for, uh, for gain before we go in and actually beat up the numbers in a valuation sense. This is a company that had been a very steady performer and its world dramatically changed. Obviously, automatic you know, downloading from the internet rather than buying games on discs in the stores mm -hmm. completely upset its business model. And it's in the mist right now, trying to figure out how it's going to fix itself or redefine itself, if you will. Yeah. So let's pull up what we call value expectations. And this is an interface that allows us to play a lot of very sophisticated what if games and scenario analysis to figure out what's going on with the stock. <clears throat> so if we were to take, say, how the stock has performed last year, with sales growth, EBITDA margins, and asset turns. And we project those out for the next five years, essentially game is worth zero. Right. The target price on the stock is zip because it essentially can't cover its debt. Right. The implications of last year, it lost sales, had negative sales of 21%, and it had EBITDA margins of two, basically call it two and a half percent. So the EBITDA margins are about half of what they were historically and the sales are absolutely atrocious. So let's do this. Let's take, start with 2021. Okay. We're gonna to go to what's called a two-stage model because 2020 is sort of known. It's not gonna have that big of an impact. 2021 mm -hmm. is what we wanna work off of here. And I was reading a little bit prior to the meeting and analysts expect that game's gonna rebound and generate profitability of about 11%. Okay. Given kind of the, the refresh cycle going on with hardware. Mm -hmm. So let's just do that one change 
and figure out what game is worth if we do that. So now if we say it grows at 11% a year instead of shrinking 20% every year, we come up with a target out here of $14 a share right here. Yeah, right. Okay. Now, the next set of questions for game is what's going to happen to margins? Because historically, they've been a 5% margin firm. More recently, we've seen they've dropped down into the zeros. But what if they can sort of inch their way back to that 5% number? So let's kind of take their margins from 2.5% up to 5 over the next five years, four years, okay. with that 11% sales growth, all of a sudden, they're worth about $30 a share, mm. well below the price where they are right now. But you can start to make a case with, with what I'd say are some relatively heroic assumptions that when it was trading at $4, back when the, the WSB folks were starting to pound the table on it, there's actually a fair amount of latent value to be had here. What if instead of 11, let's kind of put in zero sales growth and say after this refresh cycle, they're just going to keep flat. themselves where they are, keep it flat. They're worth 15. Yeah. But what if they're able to work their margins a little bit harder because they're not worried about expansion. They're not opening stores. Doing what if they can get margins stuff, up maybe to six? Or something? Yeah. Let's take a look historically. Let's look at those EBITDA margins back in time. You know, back in time, they were at eight. More recently, they were at five. They dropped the two. What if they can get them up to six? All of a sudden, you have a $20 stock with no growth. Mm -hmm. And if they could get it all the way back up to eight, which is where they were before, now we're talking about a $30 stock. Certainly not a screening buy, but mm -hmm. you can see why maybe at $4 a share, there was a lot of interest in this stock. Yeah, well, so on, on the show, the last few episodes, I've been talking about GameStop and specifically around selling some of the put options. So I've been personally for myself and some of my clients selling uh, the fives and the five and a halves a few months out, you know, getting 80 cents to a buck for, for those, you know, with the idea being that, you know, GameStop mm -hmm. might be worth, you know, 10, $15 a share. Right. And you built in a fair amount of safety for your, for your, uh, Right. So if it goes, if it goes to three and, I, and I'm forced to buy it at five, I'm, I'm happy buying them at five. That, that's the thinking behind that. Right. So what would it, what would fundamentally, what would it take for game to be a $3 stock? Let's, let's put a in yeah. a four, let's, let's put in a 4% EBITDA margin. Where does that take it with no growth? That's 10. And if they stay at 2.5, where does that take it? There you go. With two and a half percent EBITDA margins after this hardware refresh, zero growth, you're basically looking at a four dollar stock. Which, is if you're selling a five dollar put, it seems like you're right, right in the zone for some comfort safety that it's you're not making a crazy for just bet a few, at all. For just a few months out as well, it's not like I'm betting yeah, two years exactly, out in the future. Exactly. So it seems like that's a certainly a, re a reasonable approach to take with this stock and capitalize some of these crazy short-term moves. I do my work. Not necessarily the way we, we sure. don't really manage money. We don't have a position in game. Not, not our, not our kind of that's stock. Not, that's not your deal. Yeah. Uh, but, it's, but certainly when you have these gigantic price dislocations, there's no doubt that there's opportunities to be had for, you know, for nimble people that aren't necessarily Some, constrained by a style or a mandate. Some I would say sometimes, I would say actually often there's often nothing to do, you know, probably so just, just cause something is in the news, right. Doesn't mean I have to have a view on it either way. Don't have to have a view, but certainly when a stock goes from four to 300, there should be an interesting <laughs> opportunity somewhere. Could be, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. The problem, the problem is, is that if you know it, the chances are everyone else knows it too. And then it might get arbitraged away. So that's, that's the only issue with that. You know, we right. had a situation. So with, it's an interesting. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, we had a situation with GameStop where for those first few days, a lot of the brokers wouldn't even let you trade the stock or the, or the option. So, you know, having interactive brokers, I was allowed uh, to, to trade the options. Um, and, and the volume gotcha. is very, very small. So, I mean, you know, if you're managing a large, you know, $100 million, $1 billion fund, you wouldn't have been able to sell enough $5 puts to really make it worth your while either. So that was, right, that was sure, the opportunity sure. with the low liquidity, but anyway, um, fascinating. Um, anyway, let's keep going with, with this. 
It, it's, it's, uh, I think it's interesting just from the perspective of no matter how uh, unusual the price of a stock may be, yeah, there's a, there's a fair price to pay for a given set of expectations. Totally. And really that's the name of the game, right? Everybody has different expectations. Mm -hmm. And one of the most difficult parts for investors is getting a handle on what those expectations are. And, and we can take a look at Tesla and I think it'll really, you, you can see why there's so much room. There's so much, so many opportunities for buyers and sellers to have very different perspectives on the All stock. Right. So let's, let's take a look Tesla. at Tesla. Let's under jump the in with line. this. So first thing right off the bat, as you can see from a default from a very, what I'd call a pessimistic intrinsic value perspective, that you're not really allowing any pro forma data to, to work its way through. You're just saying, given its current level of performance, I'm gonna begin taking its excess returns down to zero. The stock is worth about $11 a share and it's trading at 800. So the, the first question is, is applied finance, are you guys nuts? And I'd say, absolutely not. The issue becomes, let's figure out what we're paying for because obviously from a, a default uh, systematic building out mm -hmm. of expected pro forma statements, there's a lot more going on that I'd say is very nonlinear. Well, can we look at it this way? So what, what, what will we have to, what assumptions would you what, have to build in to, to, to justify the current price? Is there a way to look at that? Correct. That's what we're going to, that's exactly what we're going to do. That's okay, exactly perfect. what we're going to do. So if we go, if we go back, let's just take a look at some, some analyst data on Tesla real quick in okay. terms of what their expected sales numbers are. Let's go to the, what we call a company snapshot. You can basically see sales growth for Tesla. Analysts are expecting 27% in 2020, and it jumps up to 50% in 2021. So let's just mm -hmm. use those as an anchor, and then okay. we're going to work off of that to figure out what's built in from that point forward. So 27 for 2020, and then 49 for 2021. Okay. We'll just start with that as a calculate that immediately gets us up to about $150 a share. Okay. So there's obviously a big growth story implied. Uh -huh. The next thing I think that's important to at least anchor on before we start to solve for the top line sales number is what type of company is Tesla? Is Tesla a manufacturer like GM or is it a hardware software manufacturer like Apple? or is it more of a pure software play like a Microsoft? Because you have very different margins. GM has margins of 15, which is approximately where we see Tesla. Apple has EBITDA margins of 30 and Microsoft has EBITDA margins of 40. So let's kind of run each of those scenarios through and kind of take a look at where that leaves us on the company. So if we were to say, let's put in margins of 17 as we had for, for a typical auto manufacturer, Let's solve for what kind of sales growth we need for Tesla. Tesla needs to grow at 90% a year from 21 to 24 to make this work. Okay. Let's put, let's put some kind of real life perspective on that. We build out a pro forma income statement and balance sheet to go along with that analysis. And that would mean Tesla has to have annual sales of about $400 billion a year in 2024. Now for perspective, GM sales right now are about a billion ten. Okay. So essentially, if it has GM type margins, Tesla has to be the entire auto industry, plus or minus, right? At, Which is within, probably with, not at the year twenty twenty four. Within twenty twenty four, exactly. Okay. Which is probably not what a typical investor has in mind. So let's let's use right. an Apple type of margin. Let's say they get their margins up to thirty percent. Let's go back and solve this guy. At thirty percent, they have to grow at about. 47% a year, okay. which essentially indicates that by 2024, let's see where they'd be. They'd basically be at 150 billion a year of sales. They basically have to be kind of a GM and a half, a GM and a half by 2024 if their margins are 30%. And you can kind of see what the trade-off is between margin and growth in order to justify a given price. Let's put in 35 and say they're somewhere between Apple and Microsoft to be generous. Yep. With that, all of a sudden, at 47% of year growth, they're cheap. 
But if we were to solve for what growth they need to justify that price, they need to grow at about 36% a year. Which isn't, if, if that, those were the margins, that wouldn't be, at, yeah. You, you need those higher margins. At that point, they basically need to be a GM by 2024. Okay. Now at 36% margins, that's obviously super rich. If you look at where they've been through time, these margins are off the charts. They've never been close to that. Yeah. But they certainly, if we put in, say, a Microsoft, for instance, we'll start with Microsoft and work our way down to an Apple. Let's take a look at Microsoft's margins quickly. Microsoft's margins <clears throat> are north of 40. Let's look at Apple. Apple's EBITDA margins, kind of that hardware-software combo. They're running, you know, 30, 32. They got as high as 37 back yeah. when they were quite a bit smaller, you know? So, you know, this notion of them being an Apple type of, uh, an Apple type of margin firm, I think is probably in the neighborhood of, of what the market's thinking, maybe call it 32, just 31, just to kind of split the difference there a little bit. Um, smooth that out. Let's, uh, let's actually go to, go to stage two, so that 32. They're putting Go 32 at 2021. So, so it's about 40% of your sales growth to justify where it is. That that to me sort of becomes the over under right. on where Tesla needs to go. That's a big number. They're expecting more than that for 2021. You know, as they get more products online, they have to battle with what's the trade off between a greater product catalog and, you know, the efficiency of their margins. Mm -hmm. And they, continue increasing margins, which they've done. I mean, I yep. think if we look at their historic path on margins, we've seen those go from negative 100% a year to more recently, they've been up at nine and inching towards 15. So certainly operationally, the margin story is in going in the right direction. We need to see it go up quite a bit faster mm -hmm. to justify where it is. It might very well be that the stock is overvalued, but you can at least start to quantify why the stock had such incredible wealth gains and you know what was going on in the back of what I'd call more enlightened investors' brains that were thinking about the transformative power of this company. It may not exactly warrant the 800, but if it was trading in the neighborhood of 100, you can see there was a lot of room for error to be wrong and still make a lot of money. Right, right. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, any other any other thoughts? How about or? yourself? Do you have any Tesla? I do not own any. Do you Tesla. have any Tesla personally, or have you recommended no. that to any clients? I, ha I have not. No, I, I don't, okay. and I don't make recommendations to clients. I actually manage it for them, but I, I have never bought any um, thing for Tesla just for this reason. Like the, I have no way of knowing what scenarios of these are true. I, I, I would say it's more likely that you have yeah. the margin of story than that than the what, ninety percent sales. But I don't know. I, I don't really know. It's a tricky story for sure. It's a tricky story for sure. Yeah. Well, Raphael, thank you so much for uh, doing this for us. Um, it's always a pleasure uh, talking and it's nice to see your tool uh, being used in real time. And for listeners uh, of the show, Raphael, if they want to get in touch with you or learn how to use this tool for themselves, where would they go? So this is really not available to the public. Noted. It's what we okay. use internally to model companies for our funds. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I well, for, if they want to get involved in your funds, I would, or, I would or, suggest that they track us. Yeah. What I what I suggest is we actually are going to make a version of this available to the public, hopefully okay. by the end of the year. Um, so if they come and get on our on our distribution list for our research at valuationedge.com, okay. Or or uh, if they're interested in the tool, go to intrinsicvalue.com and sign up for that mailing list for the future. That'd be great. All right, great. Well, Raphael, thank you so much for coming on, and I'm sure we'll talk soon. All right, Eric, take care. You bye too. Bye.